Today's guest is Sheena Yap Chen. She is an advocate of the Asian community, creating a book called Asian Women Who Boss Up, Secrets from Women Who Are Forging Their Own Path in Thriving. She has appeared on Fox, NBC, and CBS, as well as on the podcast, The Tao of Self-Confidence. Sheena loves to share about ways to build confidence and why it is so important to build a strong representation of women of color. Please give a warm welcome to Everblessed, Sheena Yap Chen. Hi. Hello there. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? Very well. Thank you. Well, I'd like to first start off with, um, do you have a particular story that goes along with your name uh, and how you were named? Is it was true? named after a famous singer called, Nate. her name was Sheena Easton. And <laughs> that's how I got the name. <laughs> oh, really? Sheena yeah. Easton. That sounds so familiar. She was a singer in like the 80s, I think. That's why. Was she like a hip hop singer? I don't know if she was a hip hop or um, because I know in the eighties they didn't call it hip hop; they called it. I think she was more pop, pop maybe. Yeah, yeah, I was into that pulp culture back in the day, and um, probably getting into the hard rock. <laughs> era. <laughs> yeah. So okay, cool. Because I mean to speak with you, Sheena, is probably as unique as it's going to be for me. Because I mean, you have such a broad range and your involvement in the community, women of culture community. And specifically, you know, you have a book that's out there. I was looking at it through Amazon. I think that was, that's amazing what you're doing for um, bringing out the voices for Other women of culture, specifically for the Asian American Pacific Islander community. And I just think that if no one hasn't heard of you yet, I would love to have the listeners know just a little bit more exactly who is Sheena Yap Chan. And um, I know you also want to talk about some things like self confidence, self love, and diversity representation. And we can dive into that as well. But I I did have a couple of questions just to get to know a little bit more about you. Now, um, tell me a bit about where you grew up and what was important back then for you. Yeah, so I was actually born in the Philippines, moved to Toronto, Canada when I was seven. And, you know, back then I never saw anybody that looked like me on TV or in magazines or on billboards. So I always felt very ashamed of my own culture. I felt like being Asian was not, not something good. Or I always felt like I needed to be a blonde hair, blue eyed girl to be seen as a beautiful woman or a beautiful girl. So growing up, I was always ashamed of, ashamed of being Asian because of that, because there was no one out there like me on different media platforms. And for me, representation is very important because I don't want our current and future generations to go through the hardships that I went through, not feeling enough, not having enough confidence, uh, you know, feeling like, I'm an outsider because we're all, we're all human, right? No matter what uh, ethnicity we are, we're all human and we all can go out there and do live life according to our terms. Exactly. And I was born overseas uh, and I did come over to the States in 88. Um, I was born in uh, Okinawa, moved to England for a little bit before I came to the States. So it was really hard for me with a lot of culture shock. Mm -hmm. Because I was so used to different, you know, the Japanese culture and the, you know, English culture in the UK and then coming to the America. So that was quite interesting, especially I think you've even mentioned that there was you had struggled in school um, at a young age because, you know, you thought there was something unusual or, or not of based on your grade that you had struggled through um, passing your grades because you drew out of the line kind of scenario. And I mean, there was just a, I think it just kind of went downhill after that, <laughs> like learning more and more about the United States and the whole, how it's the, the culture and how they treat people of color. Um, it was just like one thing after the other as to there was no respect. There was no you know, there was no love in the way I was being brought up in a different, the, the environment that I was, there was a lot of violence uh, towards brother against brother, 
you know, brothers of color and a lot of violence going on with women specifically because we were seen as less than, you know, we're we're making it a woman's world. We're making it equality um, and our voices are being heard gradually, but surely it's not as quickly as what we anticipated, but at least it's something. It's something um, that we can be proud of. So, and I just wanted to share that with you. <laughs> so, and talking about your childhood and where you grew up in the Philippines and going to um, Toronto afterwards, do you recall one of your best childhood memories? Um, I think one of my best childhood memories was maybe going to Disneyland for the first time. <laughs> um, you know, you always see it on TV and, you know, you think it's the most magical place in the world. So being able to go there for the first time was a great experience. One of the best experiences that I've encountered was when I went to Denver, Colorado. That was the moment that I decided to connect with nature. It was my first camping outing. So yeah, that was probably one of the end last childhood memories that I've had after that. I guess what will be the accomplishments that you are most proud of? Yeah, I mean, um, the book that we created, Asian Women Who Boss Up, is probably one that I'm very, you know, proud of because there's not a lot of books out there that really showcase, you know, so many Asian women on the front cover of a book and sharing their stories. And like I mentioned, representation is so important. And being able to, you know, feel the book and see all these phenomenal Asian women on the front cover and then hearing other people who've bought the book and say how it's also helped them in their own confidence or being able to relate to the stories or something that they can give their daughters to build a stronger mindset. It's, it makes, you know, it's just, it gives me so much joy because, you know, that was the whole point. We really wanted to create a stronger representation for Asian women. You know, for the longest time, we have always been seen as quiet and submissive and obedient. And because of that, you know, we're not in CEO roles, we're not in leadership roles, or there's very few, or we're seen as sex objects, right? Or retreated as such. And so this is why it's so important to create that strong representation, be able to speak our voice, share our stories, uh, step up to the plate, take it to the next level to boss up because, you know, what we're doing now is not helping us, right? I mean, a lot of us still feel like we're not enough. We go through so much mental health challenges, even more so during the pandemic. And we always feel like we're alone with our own struggles when really we all struggle. Yes, that is um, that is so true because I know that there is a, because currently I'm a comptroller for a startup company and there is a lot of, now that I'm looking through the programs that they have for grants for small businesses, for particularly minorities and um, women of color, um, before maybe what five years ago it was non-existent or barely there. So I mean, I love the idea that you have a book that specifically identifies that there's a lot of other other women out there that have the same goal and they are wanting to flourish and become successful in their businesses and their ideas and make them into a company and. Yeah, that's something that I I would love to read and I would love to identify as a show link to the show notes. If you'd like to, I'll go ahead and put that in there. That would be awesome. Thank you for sharing it. It's been a struggle. You know, it's been a struggle to to find that common ground, to find that niche in this world. And you're absolutely right. Women have been, I mean, at a young age, as girls have been taught to be seen and not heard, to be, like you said, submissive, to accept the type of mansplaining that goes on in this world where you'll never accomplish to be anything. You'll never be better than what you are because you are of this gender. You'll never be able to be independent and be strong and be successful. And so to hear that you have a book out there that is like that, that shows the complete opposite, that it has been done and it, and it can be uh, for whomever who was wanting to accomplish that goal. There is a point in time that we have to learn to turn our self-doubt to self-confidence. So could you tell me a little bit more about how, um, if you had like some type of short story identifying how that can be accomplished or a story that you've heard from either for yourself personally or from other women that you've encountered? Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, like the pandemic really hit me hard, you know, just mentally, I was not 
um, I wasn't, my mental health wasn't the greatest, right? Uh, we're stepping in, we were stepping into something that was very unknown. <laughs> we had no clue what was happening. It kind of felt like the twilight zone. And if it wasn't, you know, meeting another um, female entrepreneur who kind of helped me kind of get my, get out of my own way and start moving forward, um, I wouldn't be here today talking about it. So being able to have women who can lift you up when times are tough, I mean, that can really help build your confidence because you don't have to do this alone. And I know it's not always easy to ask for help or support uh, because of the cultural the cultural uh, barriers we go through, right? I mean, I'm Asian, of course, right? And, you know, asking for help is considered like not a, a thing, <laughs> you know, it's considered a handout or a sign of weakness, but we have to learn to help each other out so we can build our confidence faster. We can empower each other and we can move forward with whatever it is we want to do in our lives. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, I've learned young in, in life that weed out all the toxicity, no matter where it is. I mean, it could be even from family members who tell you that, how dare you think you can, you can do that. Some families, they have a tradition, like your father is this, you have to follow suit in the type of position. I guess I wanted to also hit on the subject as well. And I think you've even identified it in your book that you, you referenced in your book, the diversity and re representation. We mentioned before, like some of the things that we have hit on, we had chosen to go in a direction that our parents or family members who was always saying, why don't you, why haven't you gotten to this level? Why haven't you gone to school? Why haven't you become a lawyer? Why haven't you gotten married? Why don't you have kids? But you've chose to make this decision for yourself. What would you be doing in your with your life if this wasn't something that you had to I still love, you know, advocating for our Asian community. Uh, I mean, even if it was something that I didn't like, it's not something that I have to do. It's something that I've always wanted to do because we go through so many things. And mm -hmm. especially with the Stop Asian Hate movement, right? Racism um, has been rampant. It's been the highest, uh, racist crimes have been the highest in 12 years in America. And yet people are saying they're sick and tired of hearing about racism you know, people may be sick and tired to hear about it, but we've been through it for so many years. And they're complaining about the last couple of years that we've been talking about it. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's unfair, because, you know, every, every day, I see an elderly being attacked, whether it's being pushed on the street, or being hit with a frying pan. Um, you know, it really just breaks my heart, because that could be my grandmother, or my mom, or, you know, an auntie, right? That could be someone close to us uh, being attacked due to the color of their skin. And this goes beyond our Asian community. I mean, you know, when people think of Asian, they just think Chinese, right? They think all Asians are Chinese, and then they just attack every single Asian person to the point mm -hmm. where it even flows over, you know, the Latin community because they feel like they think that some Latin uh, Latina and Latinos look Asian and just target them for that. So um, for me, uh, it's always something that I will, I do love talking about. I do love, you know, bringing awareness because it's so needed, right? It's so needed right now. I mean, there was like a lady who's running for Senate in Texas and was basically saying that all Chinese stu students should be banned because they're all communists and, you know, things like that are very dangerous, right? Because yes. now you're lumping all Chinese people as communists, which isn't right, you know? Um, um, you know, whatever their beliefs is, you know, right? like you cannot just lump them as one thing, right? It's kind of like uh, going through the Chinese Exclusion Act over again, which was at the time in the States, you know, all Chinese people were banned from entering America. So, um, you know, this is something that would, I would, probably be doing. Um, if, if racism was never a problem, I'd probably be at the beach. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You and I both, um, cause I, I live in Texas and that's something that is just, it just beyond belief in flabbergasted as to someone just going against a particular culture, a, a community. Uh, and I believe even Canada has done that as well. I think it was in 1934, they did the same concept where yeah. no um, Chinese were allowed in there to be even to live there. And I think they've even were violently violent uh, about it as well, because if someone came across and they, they believed them to be Chinese, uh, they attacked, attacked them and 
no matter <laughs> no matter what it's um it's awful um you know i've seen my latina community and my black community go through the same thing and it's like it's even the in the indigenous community specifically as well i mean they've been fighting for hundreds of years for just being on the land being their land the land that they were gifted by by mother you know that they have to fight for the proper water supply and for food and and other supplies that are just necessities for living. Um, I am, you know, I could say I'm beyond, I'm beyond done with this, this racism. You know, I've dealt with it all my life. When I came, one of the experiences that I had when I came to America was first time I've ever heard anyone call me the N word. Um, and I'm thinking, uh, Okay. <laughs> it's, it's, and that was, I was what, uh, 10 years old, 10 or 12 years old when that happened. And it just, it, uh, it does something to your psyche on how you're being treated by who you would think they're like your friendly neighbor. Well, your friendly neighbor is not really that friendly after all, because he showed his true colors, especially, especially around the times of this, at this pandemic issue, just explosive of information in the media and articles about, uh, I think just recently, just they identified an, an Asian older man who was homeless. He was beaten with a, a two by four while walking on the street by three other men. I'm like, I am beyond livid, I guess I could say. And I'm glad that you're able to voice the, you know, and be an advocate never easy to speak up, right? It, it isn't. I mean, you don't know what's going to happen, you know, especially when you see uh, journalists, you know, women of color journalists, they get threatened every single day. They get, you know, they get harassed, right? You know, they get all kinds of hate mail, um, but yet they're still out there, you know, reporting those stories. And mm-hmm. um, it does take a lot of guts, even, you know, women creating podcasts or just sh- being able to share their authentic voice. It's not an easy thing. Um, You know, we're trying to show our true self, we get a little bit vulnerable. And you know, a lot of people think vulnerability is a weakness, it's actually a strength, your vulnerability can really help someone out there because they can relate to it. And when they know you're out there talking, and you're still standing still thriving, they can see that's possible for themselves. So, Mm -hmm. you know, we're so hard on ourselves, sometimes we just really need to give ourselves a pat on the back for just being just pushing ourselves to do something out of the norm, you know, to take that one little step forward. Right, right, exactly. One last question I'd like to ask of you is, what is the biggest myth that you see shared as advice over and over again? I think it's just like that hustle culture. I mean, you know, especially when you hear it from men saying, you got to work 12 hours a day, you got to hustle, like there's no tomorrow. I mean, you know, a, a woman can't relate to that because first of all, a woman, as a woman, we're natural born caretakers. So we're not doing just one thing. We can't just focus on our business 12 hours a day. I mean, we have other stuff to do, to be honest, whether you have kids or not, right? You're, you're mm-hmm. most likely the one to do the errands, to take care of your parents, to take care of your relatives or your nieces and nephews. Um, and even more so as a mother, right? You're taking care of the kids, running the household, doing chores, running errands, you know? Um, and so for us to even to try to do 12 hours a day is, is not realistic because as women, we're, we're doing things 24 seven all the time. Right. Um, and so before I always used to feel bad because it's like, well, I don't, I don't do that. I don't work 14 hours a day and like not talk to my family. Like, am I just doing this wrong? Um, but really when you're in that hustle culture, like, you know, you get burnt out, you don't feel good. You feel like failure. And so we need to learn to take breaks, right? Uh, instead of working hard, learning to work smart. And of course, there's going to be times we're going to work a little bit more, right? Especially when you're entrepreneurship. Um, but when you love what you do, it's not really necessarily work, right? Because you love what you're doing, right? Sometimes you're so passionate and so excited, you're going to end up working 14 hours because of excitement, not because you're hustling like there's no tomorrow. And yeah, I mean, that was just like, it just, for me, it just always rubs rubs me the wrong way because it's like it's crap (laughs) you know especially for women so when women hear this kind of things like 
they feel bad because like, well, I don't have 12 hours just to focus on my business because I still got to take care of three kids. And especially for guys to say that when they have a wife that takes care of everything else so they can focus on it. Um, you know, it's just not right to say things like that. And of course, not all men are like that, right? Of course, there's there's phenomenal men out there that also share, you know, the the, the responsibilities of taking care of a family or some of them, you know, switch switch roles, right? Of course, there's, there's men out there who do that. But um, most of the time, you know, when you see the same five guys telling you the same thing, like it just, you're just like, you know, I don't want to see these guys. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Very true. Thank you for sharing that. Could you tell the listeners exactly how they are able to reach out to you and look at this wonderful book that you have available, eye-opening on the community, the Asian community? Yeah, for sure. So uh, you can connect with me on my website, sheenayapchan.com. You can order a copy of the book there, Asian Women Who Boss Up. You can also get a free report called Eight Ways to Boss Up your confidence in life and business. Um, you can also check out all my social medias under Sheena Yapchan. And if you forget everything, you can just also Google my name, Sheena Yapchan. I'm the only Sheena Yapchan on the internet. So that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Um, if you're into podcasts, uh, I also have a podcast called The Tao of Self-Confidence, where I interview Asian women about their journey to self-confidence. And you can check that out on Apple, Spotify, Google Play, or you can check out our website, the Tao of Self-Confidence.com. Awesome. Sheena, it's been an honor. Thank you so much for your time. And you have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Thanks. You too. Great Thank meeting you. you. Nice meeting you. Bye. Have a great weekend. Bye. You too. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Noise Blue Zion podcast. And if you enjoy listening to my podcast, please don't hesitate to give me a five-star rating on Apple or Spotify also wanted to give a shout out and thank you so much to all my guests past present and future and stay tuned for the next upcoming episode on fridays